Good morning. Welcome to our service. Please stand and join me for Bells in the High Tower, number 56. We'll be doing the first and fourth verse. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome everyone to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane. I'm not going to do the regular greeting, ritualistic greeting this morning because I wanted to uh, say some things. Firstly, good to be back. Good to see you. I, I missed you uh, over the past the past month. And thank you. Thank you. But hey, I mean, what a what a fantastic. Hey guys, what a fantastic uh, lineup of guest speakers and services you had while, while I was away, right? Including starting, starting with, I think somebody read, read the first sermon that I ever gave here. Yes. Yeah, so that was probably the low point of the, of the month, but <laughs> nevertheless, uh, what fun. So anyway, I, I'm, I'm doing well. Great, great to be back, especially to start uh, my, my return with such a special service, the celebration of our 33-year partnership with our uh, Unitarian Congregation in Felsharakos, what is now Romania. Uh, they consider themselves their Transylvanians, so not to get into the politics of what's going on, but uh, uh, it's great to, to be able to celebrate that relationship. I mean, we're going to be talking about, I'll be talking about later, and lots of the music and stories you'll hear will represent that as well. Uh, there's uh, some of the, uh, the artwork uh, from that part of the world on display in the back. And there's actually gonna be a, a luncheon, some authentic Hungarian goulash, if you wanna stay around after the service to participate in that. The, the bells that you heard uh, when you came in at the start of the service are a recording of the actual bells that ring every Sunday in Felsharakos, Romania at the start of their services. And, and it's a small enough village that uh, they will ring them at other times as well to alert people to uh, be alert. I don't know about what, but. <laughs> so, so um, and, and I was sharing at the first service, it reminds me, we don't have a lot of bells in our services here in, in the States. That's one difference between us. But when, when Peggy and I were at the church in, in Louisville, Clifton Unitarian Church, which uh, I can't remember when that church was founded. It was started as, as, a, uh, as a Lutheran church. And all the original sermons were in German. And then it became a Unitarian in 1917 over the women's rights to vote. They voted to have women on their board. And the Synod said, you can't do that. And they said, well, we'll become Unitarians. <laughs> That's an interesting story, but they had a bell tower in the sanctuary. And it, these three ropes hung down. There were different size bells. And every Sunday at the start of the service, the kids would go over and grab the bells and they'd ring the bells. And every now and then they'd get excited with the small rope and they'd yank it too hard and let go and up it go. <laughs> and we'd have to call the fire department to come and go climb up there and get it down for us. <laughs> so it brings back uh, really warm memories to hear those bells at the start of our service on spe such a special day. So uh, I, so, so again, welcome and welcome to uh, all of you. It's good to see you again. Those of you who are visiting, who I may be just meeting for the first time or haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, uh, I, uh, it's so good to have all of you here with us as well today. And uh, yeah, thanks for, for welcoming me back. Uh, 
I did want to mention one announcement because this is uh, perhaps an important one for many. Uh, following our services next Sunday on March 10th, at 1230, our pastoral care team is offering a Dementia Friends Workshop to learn about dementia and what actions we can take to support our friends and family members who are suffering from dementia or memory loss. And our own Cindy Fine, who's right here, is going to be facilitating it. She's a former employee and now volunteer with Aging and Long-Term Care of Eastern Washington. So thank you for that. And it's going to be in the chapel, which is the section of, or just, just off the sanctuary there. About 90 minutes long. If you want to bring lunch, you're welcome to. There's going to be, I think, light, light snacks uh, served as well. So put that on your calendar. And thanks to the pastoral care team for organizing that for us. So enough said. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and welcome one another for a, a few minutes before we uh, proceed with uh, some of our other uh, worship rituals. <coughs> Wow, that was a dramatic quiet down for all the talking. Usually you guys take a few minutes, but it was like, like I just turned the dial down there. But we'll turn it back up after the service during our social hour, as always, give you more opportunity to visit with one another and enjoy some conversation, some goulash, an extra cup of coffee. But for now, we are going to move forward by lighting our chalice, the symbol of our unity and our solidarity, of our openness and our inclusion, of our community and our individual uniqueness. May this small flame be our offering of warmth to those who are cold and alone and a light to those in darkness. May it be a flame that ignites justice in our world and a beacon of hope to those in need. And may it reflect at least a spark of truth wherever truth has been lost and cast a healthy shadow of doubt 
wherever it's been found. The opening words are by Thomas More. An enchanted life has many moments when the heart is overwhelmed by beauty and the imagination is electrified by some haunting quality in the world or by a sp spirit or voice speaking from deep within a thing, a place, or a person. As mystics of many religions have taught, that sense of rapturous union can give a sensation of fulfillment that makes life purposeful and vibrant. Please stand, join me for number 352, Find Stillness. Thank you. We're now going to kindle our candles of care for those who are most on our hearts and minds this morning. Uh, seems in many ways the world has fallen into even worse turmoil than a month ago when I started my sabbatical. I was certainly keeping up with that and that M and uh, I'm extremely troubled over the inability of our own country to live up to our expectations and our values due to the utter lack of tolerance of different viewpoints by people who are in very powerful positions. And so we've been beginning our service now for, for some time, or our can this, this part of our service, our candles of care, with a candle on behalf of the people of Ukraine and that part of the world on behalf of the people in Israel and the Palestinians. And uh, We've hit this, it seems like we've just hit this spot where, the, where our responsibility as a, as a country has fallen far short, is making matters far worse for the people who need us most, need us to function most. And ultimately, this is really the value of the Unitarian faith. This ultimately is what we're based on, that we can live together and love together without thinking together. It's the message the world needs. And it grieves us deeply as religious liberals to see our own nation failing, failing in its responsibility to be a positive force in the world. So we light a candle for our own, uh, 
our own nation as well, and the people who are suffering from the incivility amongst us. And I will light a candle on behalf of our friends across the waters in Fellowship Rocco's Romania, our partner church. We've been partners with them now for 33 years. Ever since the end of the Cold War, let us hope that we do not start a new one. Allowed us to come back together, and I, I know some of them are probably up tonight watching this service, so we're so glad to have you. And if not, you may watch it uh, on the, the recorded recording later on. But uh, it's been so wonderful to be part of your lives and have you part of our lives for so many decades now. And uh, we're so happy to celebrate that relationship today. So let's take a quick moment of silence on behalf of others that you might be thinking of. And as always, you're welcome to name them aloud at this time if you'd like. Those named aloud and those embraced in our silence and all those who are suffering in our world at this hour, we hold in our community with compassion. Oh. I'm a little rusty. <laughs> yeah, this is actually a, a uh, special collection. We usually have our special collection on the third Sunday of the month, but because this is our partner church Sunday, and the special collection will go to supporting our friends in Fel Shoraco. So I want to definitely make that announcement that uh, if you use the special collection envelope, those, uh, those resources will go to some of the many needs that they have uh, in Fel Shoraco. So we're going to watch a brief video in a little bit, and they'll talk about just, some, some, uh, about just a few of the, uh, the many things they have, the, much, the, the, the work that they have to do. Uh, in the village there. So uh, I thank you so much for your compassion and generosity in advance. We now gratefully give and receive this morning's offering, which helps sustain this community and our mission to the larger world. Oh, 
At this point, I'd like to invite any children to come forward for our time for all ages. Come on down. There's going to be pictures on the screen, and you'll be able to see them better if you're sitting in the front row. Right, so this morning's story is about a partnership between a Unitarian Universalist church in Boise, Idaho, and a Unitarian church in Transylvania. The story is called Little Bridge. And Todd is a fabulous slide advancer. We've got lots of pictures for you. Little Bridge was uh, designed by a couple of people. The photography was by a couple of other people. And it was written by two other people. So you'll see in these slides the six people that are responsible for making this book. And our church's connection to this story, I should share, is that this was the Unitarian Universalist church that Julie Jose was part of before she moved to Spokane. Once upon a time, there were two groups of people who believed that everything in the world is connected. One group was the Boise Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, which was near a lovely river in Garden City, Idaho. The other was their sister church in the town of Mesco, which was far away in the beautiful countryside of Transylvania. They dreamed of a way to build a bridge of friendship between the two churches. The people in Transylvania were dreaming of their friends in Boise. They shared letters about their dreams. One day, a dream was born. It became Little Bridge. Little Bridge saw that there were wetlands on the beautiful land around the Boise church. The people put a board over the water to help them cross the stream to Jeremiah's Adventure Garden. There needed to be a safer way to cross. The people of the church in Boise began to feed and care for the dream of Little Bridge. They gave love and energy to it. Crane came to see Little Bridge. Crane picked up two heavy steel girders in its big, strong arms. It put the girders across the stream to give strength and power to Little Bridge. Little Bridge looked around the lovely spot and saw beautiful flowers that the people had planted. It saw a sunflower house and dreamed of being tall. Little Bridge looked up at the clear blue sky. It dreamed of growing clear up to that sky. The people wanted to see Little Bridge grow. They began to carve posts with designs from Transylvania. They drilled holes for big bolts to help make Little Bridge strong. Little Bridge knew that many people from around the world would cross over this stream. Little Bridge could be a safe, welcoming path for everyone. One person thought that trolls lived under Little Bridge, so he jumped into the water to see if it was true. He got wet and muddy. I don't think there were any trolls. Little Bridge wanted to help people stay dry. Little Bridge got railings to hold people in its arms and keep them safe. The people made a roof like the ones in Transylvania with a crown on top. Many people climbed up high to help put on Little Bridge's crown. How proud Little Bridge was. It began to dream of tulip, a very special flower in Transylvania. Little Bridge wanted to dress up in tulips. People carved tulips into the railings and roof timbers. They also cut two other designs into the railings, but they are a surprise. Only very short people can look out through the cut holes in the railing, but everyone can find the surprise. See if you can find it. And I'll bring this book back, kids, to Children's Chapel so you can take a closer look. Now Little Bridge stands tall and beautiful. It is proud to be a bridge of friendship between the Boise Unitarian Universalist Fellowship and their sister church in Mesco, Transylvania. The people wanted to make a great party to honor Little Bridge. Today is the day of the party. We will share Hungarian music and have a parade over Little Bridge. We will bring flowers and have special things to eat and drink. We will take pictures of us all around Little Bridge and send them to Transylvania. Today, Little Bridge will be given its own special name. Can you find the new name of Little Bridge? You will in Children's Chapel. Take a moment to think of a loving thought that you could take across Little Bridge today. A loving thought for the world and how everything is connected. The end. Or a truly wonderful beginning. And before we send the children out, 
Um, kids, I want to invite you to stay for this next portion of our service, which is a short interview with the minister and her husband. És a nagyszüleim nagyon egyszerű, de mégis vallásos emberek voltak. Her uh, grandparents are a very religious uh, person. Her grandfather uh, was a minor, and uh, her relationship with God it's very deep because uh, every day when he entered in the mine he crossed his hands and prayed for the god and uh, in the end of the day when he got out from the mine then he crossed his hands again and thanked for the day and that that he survived so nagyon kicsi korom óta azt láttam hogy uh, hogy uh, istennel együtt élni jó, nem tudom, tehát hogy könnyű legyen. And uh, Monica learned from uh, his uh, grandfather that uh, living with the presence of God it's very good, good. and beautiful. When she was in third grade, uh, she fought with her uh, brother, with her brother, and the penalty from her grandmother was to write a letter with the title. The love of my heart. Én úgy érzem, hogy a Jóisten segített nekem megírni azt a. And uh, Monica think that uh, God helped her, helped her to write that letter. Mm-hmm. And uh, her her grandmother said that uh, the letter was very beautiful, and that uh, they minister can write such a beautiful letter. Hogy akkor én pap leszek. And then Monica said that uh, if 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 that's the case, then I will become a minister. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> In third grade. We are in the uh, the twenty one century, but here in uh, Transylvania, they are still. Uh, conservative, traditional. There is a saying here that the woman needs to be in the kitchen, near the wooden spoon. It's it's changing. I mean, not all the congregation is like that. The most of the congregation, they accepted it and they uh, they are happy about that, that we are here, we, we love us. They are happy that, they, that, uh, that, that things are different now. But uh, it's, it's a very big difference in between a, 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 a man minister and a woman minister. The men's are more rational. I, I think that's my personal opinion that the, a, a man minister can't, can't open the gates of the soul like a woman can do it. Okay. Women speak different, differently about, this, about our souls and our feelings. And they can make us the the people of the congregation to 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 open up and uh, try to try to tell our, our feelings too celebration uh, they they were celebrations here when monica was uh, taking the job. he was speaking at the end of the celebration everyone cried i don't i i don't say that men can't do can't do that but it's 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 more easy for a woman. Egyszerre kell legyen minister, édesanyja, házi asszony, feleség. They need to be minister, moms. Uh, they they need to hold the house uh, when it's a lot to do. My but is very good. Yes. At helping. And, at and helping. Uh, at <laughs> We have a, a lot, uh, a lot to repair. The case with the church is that because it's a monument, and it's very difficult to repair it, and a, a lot of uh, paperwork to the to the government to let us repair it. And the uh, and the guest house, which which you also contribute contributed to building it, we need to 
change the tiles on the roof and uh, we have another uh, room at the guest house which is which is not used so we we had an idea that we should be making a, another kitchen there because the kitchen which was made in the basement in the yeah basement. in the the walls are very very wet the walls are sucking the water from the ground so it's uh, it's it's very difficult to use to use that uh, as a kitchen I don't want to wave now. <laughs> yeah. I want to play with the, with the laptop. For this morning's meditation, I invite you to consider the words of Lama Das. With every breath, the old moment is lost. A new moment arrives. We exhale and we let go of the old moment. It is lost to us. In doing so, we let go of the person we used to be. We inhale and breathe in the moment that is becoming. In doing so, we welcome the person we are becoming. We repeat the process. This is renewal. This is life.
Thank you so much. As I began contemplating this morning's sermon about the similarities between Eastern Unitarianism and Western Unitarianism, I realized that the differences, though interesting, are insignificant compared to the important similarities. And this assertion itself is almost incredible considering that Eastern European Unitarianism was officially established in Hungary 457 years ago and Western Unitarianism emerged separately just over 200 years ago, so kind of on different timelines. And the, the most obvious difference is the vast distance between East and West, especially between North America and, and Eastern Europe. We're separated by oceans, language, culture, and in modern times, by the Cold War until the fall of communism in the late 1980s, which is what allowed us to form our partnership to begin with. It's now easier and safer to travel across the planet than it had been for almost the past two centuries, although the vast geographic and linguistic and cultural barriers still make it difficult for us to relate to one another. Yet, if you're fortunate enough to do so, upon visiting Unitarians in Eastern Europe, including its small village like our partner church in, in Felsharakos, you will find, as the Paul McCartney and Stevie Wonder song says, people are the same wherever we go. And this was the most startling realization during my two visits there, that people everywhere are far more alike then we are different. Regardless of our many differences, there is one common humanity that unites all of us and helps us to communicate, understand, and recognize each other beyond language and culture. Just this week I read that Albert Einstein wouldn't fill out forms that asked his race unless there was a place for him to, where he could write human. We're all part of the human race, one human race. And nothing helps us realize this more than being with people we initially mistake as different from us. And this should be especially so for Unitarians. No matter where we're from or what language we speak or how different our cultures, because Unitarianism is the theological belief in the humanity of Jesus and thus in the goodness and potential and agency of humankind. Hungarian Unitarians famously say, Eg ja Isten, which means God is one. But it is as much a disbelief in the deity of Jesus or of Christ than in monotheism's one true God. Yet they greatly revere Jesus and they strive rather than to worship him to follow, actually follow his humanitarian, communitarian teachings. For this is how we truly establish heaven on earth through our own efforts and actions. Another difference is our age. Eastern European Unitarianism emerged from the Protestant Reformation and was formalized during the Renaissance when certain liberal ideas, especially this idea of religious tolerance, were still new. New and received mostly with suspicion and often responded to with violence and persecution. Calling for tolerance then could get you killed. Western Unitarianism began rather during the Enlightenment. After the liberal ideas birthed during the Renaissance had been around long enough that people began to take them seriously and became open to their possibilities. These values, as you, as you often hear me say, are rooted in the fundamental, fundamental belief in the inherent worth and dignity of every person a dignity that is sustained by creating systems and societies based on freedom, 
on reason, and on tolerance. By the time of the Enlightenment, when these pro-human and pro-individual, right, the welfare of humanity, individual unfolding, right, those are our priorities, human welfare in general, and that every individual can fully unfold without being suppressed by their society or by others. By then, the only question was, what systems then need to be in place to, to make this happen, to guarantee these? this kind of society, freedom, reason, and tolerance. So then they, were, they, they accepted the idea of tolerance, but didn't quite know how to make it happen. So during the Renaissance, most people were suspicious and fearful of radical beliefs, especially of tolerance. Intolerance, which forced everyone to think alike, was considered the only means of maintaining the peace. Surely the freedom to express different beliefs could only lead to disagreements and therefore disorder. The idea of tolerance was considered such an obvious evil that it itself could not be tolerated. Lest it spread and disturb the peace. So it took a lot of bravery. It took a lot of courage for our Eastern Unitarian ancestors to openly promote during the Renaissance what has become the central and most necessary principle of any enlightened society. There's also a major theological difference you may have noticed in the interview. Eastern, Unitarian, Eastern European Unitarians have services that are more like many of the Christian services here in the West compared to our Unitarian churches or services. They always be begin theirs with a reading from the Bible, which becomes then the main focus of that service. You're not going to hear any Emerson or Mary Oliver read in our Transylvanian congregations. Although they believe Jesus was only human and that there is only one God, they very reverently speak of both. Western Unitarians, who again haven't been around as long, have more quickly evolved beyond our Christian roots and wouldn't describe ours as a Christian religion anymore, although there are some Unitarian churches in the West that do, and some Unitarians in almost every Unitarian church that consider themselves Christians liberal Christians. And almost all of us, all of our churches, in, in our churches, are open to occasionally benefiting from the wisdom of Jesus, especially his authentic teachings, although many of us are more comfortable calling ourselves humanists or agnostics or even atheists. In Eastern Europe, particularly in Transylvania and Poland, Unitarianism began again with the emphasis on Jesus's humanity, the belief that is that he was only human. That's what Unitarianism, Unitarianism is. It is synonymous with what we would call a humanistic Christology. The belief that Jesus was but a man. And thus it rejects Trinitarian doctrine and is often defined as anti-Trinitarian Christianity, or has been defined as such. Although the belief in Jesus' humanity actually existed 300 years before Christianity was appropriated by the Roman Empire, and the Nicene Creed formally claimed that the Father and the Son were one and the same. 50 years later, in 381 CE, the Holy Spirit was added to the mix, and Trinitarian doctrine was fully formed and expressing the Unitarian mantra, God is one, became illegal. It became heresy. In the West, Unitarianism began with an emphasis on humanity itself and was initially referred to as Arminianism, a belief that human beings are born with the capacity to do good. So it was born more out of a rejection of 
orig the doctrine of original sin than a rejection of the Trinitarian doctrine. It was a, a, a belief in the positive agency and possibility of human beings to make a difference. So it was only later that its adherents began to call themselves Unitarians, thinking it was a better term. Rather than relying on one God, for which Unitarian gets its name, and West, its Western incarnation more readily relies upon human agency to make the changes in the world that we want. We're more devoted to human welfare than we are to any idea of God. It's a big difference. Unitarians in the East may have similarly evolved had it not been for the premature death of Hungarian King John Sigismund Sapolya, who died in an accident non, not long after adopting Unitarianism as his kingdom's, as, as Transylvania's official religion, hence making it for the first time ever a formal religion, and issuing the first religious toleration law in history shortly thereafter. It's a remarkable saying that the first religious toleration law in history was born in the Renaissance by Unitarians. Now after his death in 1571, a Catholic was sadly appointed king by the next door neighbor who really pulled the strings, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, who particularly disliked Unitarians. And when the Calvinists took over in 1605, they were willing to tolerate the Unitarians, which meant they took 62 of their churches for their own use and required them to worship Christ, observe the Lord's Supper, and baptize infants, all of which are antithetical to Unitarian beliefs. So our Eastern European brothers and sisters have been forced to express their Unitarianism, their belief in one God and Jesus' humanity and human dignity and in religious tolerance under the cover of basic Christian orthodoxy. Again, this did not happen in the West where we have been freer to let go of old religious language and beliefs in favor of new ways of understanding, although we've never until very recently, sadly, abandon the core values that make us religious liberals to begin with. No matter the changes we have gone through, transcendentalism and humanism, we had not abandoned those core values, fundamentally being tolerance. Another difference which I'm very envious of is Unitarian churches in the East include everyone in the surrounding community not just those who come to church on Sundays. The Sunday attendance at our partner church in Felsharakos is very small compared to the hundreds of people who live in the village. But it's considered a Unitarian village, and the church and its minister's work is for the welfare of their entire Unitarian community. So the very first item that we helped them purchase when our partnership began three decades ago was a badly needed tractor. Now, why would a, tractor, a church need a tractor? A church doesn't need a tractor, but that's what the community needed, and so that's what the church asked for because the church was looking out for the welfare of their community. It's beautiful, isn't it? In our communities here, there are many different churches, even in our smallest of towns, so that it would be presumptive for any one congregation to think that they represent the entire community. But in what is now considered Romania, many villages, which we would call towns, are mostly segregated by religion. Catholic villages, reform villages, Unitarian villages, of which Unitarians represent a very small minority, less than 5% of the population. And this is not to suggest that people of other religions are not allowed to visit or live in these villages, only that they are predominantly comprised of the one religion. It may also be of interest to understand 
The designation village is a technical one that is based or determined upon the population. A city, which has a much larger population than a village, gets state funding, which is then the city council's responsibility to partly use to help support the villages in the surrounding area. Felsharacos is a village that has around 300 homes, and, and those homes exist on streets and, and uh, roads not unlike our, our own, which have televisions and satellite dishes and other modern conveniences. So they are not living in huts under thatch roofs atop dirt floors, even though we call them villages. Churches there are also state-funded there's not the separation of church and state. Remember, it comes out of a communist culture, right? So uh, since Unitarianism is the minority religion, perhaps I should also say that uh, the congregations there are not autonomous, or at least as autonomous as ours, as free as ours. The Unitarian Church of Transylvania, which is the umbrella organization, was founded in, again in 1568, is the oldest continuous Unitarian religion in the world, and has not adopted congregational polity. Rather, it maintains a hierarchical structure that includes a bishop, two curator generals, and five archbishops, if you will, although there is m much freedom within the constraints of this system. So they do have some say, for example, in which minister they will choose out of those that are presented <laughs> or sent their way. So all of these differences pale in significance to the important ways that Unitarianism in Eastern Europe, particularly those in Romania, formerly Hungary, and those of us in the West are similar. The most important similarity of all, as far as I am concerned, is our unwavering and primary commitment to this principle of tolerance. To understand why I say this, it's important to understand a little bit more about Unitarianism's Eastern European history, to understand what they've gone through. Although its roots go back to the beginnings of Christianity itself, I'll begin with King Sigismund's Edict of Torda in 1568. I, let me back up. The reason I say its roots go back to Christianity itself, because the early Christians the one thing they would have known about Jesus is that he was a human being, right? Jewish people did not, would not worship a human being as God. That would have been <laughs> anathema. So it wasn't until, again, uh, the Christian is the Romanization of Christianity that it became permissible to worship a man uh, as a God, which was not uncommon among Romans or Greeks. So these values of welcoming the outcast, tolerance, go back to Jesus, the teachings of Jesus himself. So that's where Unitarianism started and the Unitarian idea that, that Jesus was human, the, the humanistic Christology goes back to the beginning. We were here first, I like to say. But I'm gonna begin, uh, you know, 1500, more than 1500 years later with King Sigismund's Edict of Torda, again in 1568, the first religious toleration law in history. And this wasn't purely ideological, but was issued for very practical purposes. Since the fall of Rome, Transylvania had been the gateway through which Eastern invaders, like the Goths, the Huns, the Turks, and others entered Europe and was a place where there was much incivility, as much incivility as there was diversity because of these different people traveling through. It was also an epicenter of war and civil war, and by the time that Sigismund was king, it had also become a battleground, a religious battleground, between resident Lutherans and Catholics, along with, I should say Lutherans and Calvinists, along with some Catholics and Muslims, and was also the gateway between the embittered Ottoman Empire and Austria, right? Hungary was, or Transylvania was the, the land that separated those two conflicting cultures. Imagine being the king of that. 
and figuring out how you're going to make peace. So it was actually the young prince's mother, Queen Isabella, when he was still a boy, essentially, who drafted an earlier religious toleration law in 1557, stating that each person maintain whatever religious faith he wishes. 1557, guys. That each person maintain whatever religious faith he wishes with old or new rituals. It's okay. While we at the same time leave it to their judgment to do as they please in the matters of faith. Just so long, however, is they bring no harm to bear on anyone at all. Right out of the dark ages, way before it's time. She was a very good mother to have for young Sigismund, 11 year, who 11 years later organized the Diet of Torda to listen to all the religious leaders in his Hungarian kingdom to see which was best, which he liked best, and he wisely chose Unitarianism the religion based on tolerance. We need not think alike to love alike. And issued his famous edict soon thereafter. His Unitarian historian David Bombaugh says, in view of religious intolerance, the religious intolerance of dissent displayed throughout Europe, Eastern Europe at the time, this edict is a remarkable document designed to protect minority opinions and to keep the peace The Edict of Torda states in part, we demand in our dominions there will be freedom of conscience. We demand it. <laughs> That's our history. That's our roots. We demand there will be freedom of conscience. Therefore, none of the superintendents or others shall abuse the preachers. No one shall be reviled for his religion by anyone, according to the previous statutes. Mama Isabella. And it is not permitted that anyone should threaten anyone else by imprisonment or by removal from his post for his teaching. Right out of the Dark Ages. On January 14, 1571, at age 31, Sigismund officially recognized Lutherism, Calvinism, Catholicism, and Unitarianism as received religions in his kingdom, in addition to many others that were legally tolerated. Sadly, the next day, he was severely injured in a carriage accident and died only a few weeks later. Afterward, as I mentioned, the Catholics, followed by the Calvinists, were granted dominion in the kingdom by the Sultan. And the, by, by the way, those were decisions were based on, or the Sultan always based those decisions on whatever politics were going on with Austria at the time. Which one would piss them off more? <laughs> All right. Yeah, a very political situation. But they were granted dominion of the kingdom, and, and the edict was, un, was then undermined very quickly by what they called anti-innovation laws that didn't allow any new religions or new ideas to be tolerated or to ex be expressed. So all the, the former religions were, were grandfathered in to say uh, to this, but there could be no new, no new ideas. And uh, in fact, Sigismund's Unitarian bishop, who largely helped frame the, the, the Edict of Torda, Ferenc David, the great Unitarian Ferenc David, was arrested soon after his death for violating anti-innovation laws, that is, for expressing new ideas. And many called for his execution, but he was merciful, mercifully put into a cold dungeon instead, where he soon became sick and died only six months later. 
As I mentioned a moment ago, the Unitarians were allowed to exist, but they were extremely discriminated against. Their churches and their rights were disregarded for generations, and as late as 1728, there was even a failed attempt to outlaw Unitarianism there altogether to make it illegal. As Bombas succinctly explains, the government created a fund for the conversion of Unitarian children, decreed no non-Unitarian might marry a Unitarian, prohibited any public discussion of Unitarianism, forbade conversion to Unitarianism, closed Unitarian schools, and refused to permit any new churches to be built or any existing churches to be repaired. That's what toleration meant back then. They were tolerated only in the most basic meaning of the term that they would not be killed, but were not treated well as equals under the law. Ever since, as mostly ethnic Hungarians, Unitarians there have been under the rule of various foreign powers and have experienced brutality, ethnic cleansing, and of the denial of their right to express their own culture and to even speak their own language. Even today, the brilliant high school students in Felsharakos that many of us support, members of our partner church, and th those throughout Russia are at constant risk of flunking their state exams so that they can move on to college because Hungarian is their native tongue and the region's indigenous language, yet the tests are administered in Romanian, the language of the country that has claimed that region since the end of World War II or was really granted them by Russia as kind of an act of retaliation against Hungary for siding with Germany during that war, so to speak. Hungary is rightly considered the birthplace of religious tolerance. And the United States has been said to have founded the greatest democracy in history. But today such tolerance and freedoms, the freedoms it demands, are under threat in both places, as well as in many other places around the world. This is an unfortunate similarity shared by our respective countries in both the East and the West. Today, Transylvania, which was historically part of Hungary, then give, again given to Romania by the Soviet Union after World War II, isn't much farther from Russia than Vladimir Putin's and then Russia and Vladimir Putin in his intent on recreating an Eastern Bloc than Ukraine is. The threat of losing their freedoms, again, is very real. In the Western world, we're facing a new wave of authoritarianism on both sides of the political aisle. In the U.S. in particular, we're, we're looking at the serious possibility of a populist despot returning to power by a political party that doesn't seem to care what's happening in the rest of the world so long as they can shut down the government here. I recall some Trump voters in the last election holding signs saying, I'd rather be a Russian than a Democrat. Given the inability of their now fractured party to lead or accomplish anything meaningful and their failure to safeguard our freedoms and our international interest and to live up to our nation's great values, they may get their wish. Meanwhile, liberals are continuing to cannibalize ourselves destroying our institutions and organizations from within by accusing everyone around us of being the bad guy because of what they say, the color of their skin, their gender, their sexuality. 
we have become the very thing that we once opposed. And many Western nations, including our own, are caught up in a soft civil war in which almost all of us, no matter what side of the issues we're on, rage against anyone who disagrees with us or with whom we disagree by using powerful social media tools to destroy their character and their livelihood by lodging false information and accusations. Which I won't say more about this tragic situation now. Everyone knows what I'm talking about and how bad it is, I hope. Today there's only one way out of this terrible milieu. To do as our Unitarian ancestors once did when such incivility was tearing their world apart. We must demand as Queen Isabella and Prince Sigismund did, that in our dominions there will be freedom of conscience. We leave it to their judgment to do as they please in the matters of faith, just so long, however, as they bring no harm to anyone at all. Just imagine what our world and our communities might be like if instead of considering those we disagree with our enemies, we just tolerate our differences. The world would almost instantly become a far better place if we could all only agree to disagree. Instead of, instead of vying for which idea will be in power, which idea will dominate, Which team will win the Super Bowl? Today, as Unitarians everywhere, we must promote a renewed commitment to such civility and to peace through tolerance. The principle at the heart of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment from which our religion sprang. The Unitarian historian Earl Morse Wilbur once said, the first and most essential of our principles is that of a generous tolerance of different views. That's our principle. Generous tolerance of different views. Today, our more than 30-year partnership with our friends and fellow Unitarians and fellow Chiracos reminds us of where we come from, of our vital place in the world, of the direction we must go together, and of the shared values that will get us there. Amen. Thank you. Please stand, join me for 346. Uh, come sing a song with me.
Sometimes we make the process more complicated than we need to. We will ne never make a journey of a thousand miles by fretting about how long it will take or how hard it will be. We make the journey by taking each day step by step and then repeating it again and again until we reach our destination. Joseph Wertheland. Amen, blessed be, salam alaikum, and shalom.